Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The sport itself is, is 4,000 years old, according to the first petroglyphs in, in, that was discovered in Russia. But for the last 2,000 years, for instance, there's been an evolution in the sport. And right now, it's at this, the state of the sport right now is at its peak. And I think it's time to start in Jackson Hole, to start documenting the heritage and the history of skiing. I think the first skiers in, in uh, Wyoming were the, the ranchers and the, the homesteaders. There's even evidence of Native American skiing. There's uh, some petroglyphs that, that show the shape of a ski on a figure. But uh, uh, homesteaders, people that came and settled, stayed the winter and uh, needed to get around. The first people to ski into the mountains themselves and actually you know, use the skis for travel in the mountains were the mail carriers. They had to bring mail in from Idaho into Jackson Hole. And so they toured up the west side of the pass and up and over and, and then down the other side and then vice versa. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service wanted uh, proof that it was a viable uh, you know, option to, to use mail carriers to, ac to access the, the, the valley. And uh, I suppose it was. Skiing remained a utilitarian activity, used primarily for locomotion until the 1920s and 30s when Teton Valley residents began hiking up Snow King Hill in Jackson and skiing down for recreation. Some started pushing the boundaries of the new sport in other ways. Forest Service worker Mike O'Neill, a group of friends nicknamed the Hoback Boys, and Norwegian brothers Svera, Corey, and Alf Engen were among those who introduced ski jumping as an exciting new pastime in the valley. At the beginning of the sport, there was as much interest in jumping as there was in skiing, because the spectators really liked to see that, that action of flying through the air. And I'll tell you this, when teaching kids these days, they want to ski, but they also want to jump. Where's the jumps is what they all want to know. And they know where they are better than I do. Ski jumping is great fun. Beginners make little jumps. With more practice, boys and girls learn to make long, graceful leaps, flying through the air like birds. Other pioneers in the 1930s were pushing skiing in a different direction. They started using skiing as a way to explore the backcountry in the Teton Range. Betty Woolsey, Grant Hagen, and young Fred Brown were among these first ski mountaineers. Fred's gallivanting around the Tetons, you know, earned him the nickname Tarzan of the Tetons. Not only did he ski in places that people couldn't imagine, he was on the first winter ascent of the Grand Teton with Paul Petzold, you know, driven to explore the Tetons. He loved to uh, go into the Tetons, you know, into the high peaks and into the Teton Crest area uh, in the spring. The Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club was founded in 1938 by some local ski enthusiasts who wanted to provide activities for kids to participate in during the winter. Today their mission has largely stayed the same, but recently the club has taken on another role, preserving and sharing the history of Teton Valley skiing. As part of the Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club's 75th anniversary celebration, we decided to create a ski museum, essentially a historic timeline that celebrates the rich history of Jackson's ski heritage. It starts back in the late 1800s to the start of Snow King, to the start of the club, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort uh, coming and, and really celebrates the incredible athletes, volunteers, and people that have made Jackson what it is today. It's for the current generation, but it's also for the, that next generation needs to know what the history and the heritage is because there's a great uh, legacy in the sport of skiing and snowboarding, by the way. The new ski museum is located in the Snow King Ski Shelter. 
Its timeline allows visitors to experience the legacy that Jackson Skiing has built. This is a picture of our founder, Neil Rafferty. And Neil was a, quite the character. He was born and raised in Grand Pian, Pennsylvania. He did a, a stint in the U.S. Marine Corps. He headed west in the early 30s, hitchhiking, walking, ride the rails, take a bus, whatever it took. He got into Jackson Hole, I think it was in 1933, supposedly with a dime in his pocket. He skied in the early 30s on Snow King, but also up on Jackson Lake. He worked for the phone company, inspecting phone lines between Moran and Dubois. And at one time, he snowshoed from Moran to Dubois and back, 50 miles each way. That's the kind of guy he was. So in the late 30s, Neil was skiing, climbing up Snow King with one of the Forest Service guys, I think his name was Ken Hodges. And he and Neil decided, we need to have an easier way up than this climbing stuff. So he got this idea of having an uphill conveyance. Got together with local business people. He put in a bid with the town of Jackson to be the first operator of a ski area. He had a drawing of, of his idea of what it would look like. They got the lift, they put it in, and they became Jackson Hole's, at least Jackson Hole's first ski area. It was a cable tow with metal handles on it. It was brought here from uh, oil rig in Casper and, and motor drive down the bottom. <clears throat> it went up to about a third of the way up the mountain. This was the first year, I think uh, 1939, 1940 was the first season. And you'll notice the amount of cars out here. There's a few people skiing, there's people over here on the slope, but a lot of people came just to watch because skiing was pretty much a fascination at that time. So I think right now, I would like to have that many people in our parking lot today. Now let's see you walk. Remember to keep your skis straight, then you won't fall. And now, down comes Bill. And down comes Nell. And Charlie comes down. Up again, that's the boy. This was the control panel for Wyoming's first chairlift. Built in 46, 47, opened in 47. It was a top drive diesel engine. So they had to press this for start. They would get it and send it the communication line. It would go up and start the engine from the top. And if the top operator on Tuesday didn't turn the engine heater on Wednesday morning, he was going to have to climb up and start the, the heater, and when the engine warmed up, they'd start it. People began to take notice of Jackson. While still attending Dartmouth in the early 1950s, Bill Briggs felt the draw of the Tetons. In the wintertime, we came out um, uh, between semesters, coming over Togarty Pass. There was a rope tow operating up there, so we go over to ski the rest of the afternoon over there and the guy didn't charge us and we say whoa okay let's stay over and we'll ski snow king and had a wonderful time doing that and uh, went over to sun valley and down to elton and then aspen anyway good trip good fun the uh, introduction to experiences here in the valley uh, convinced me that I wanted to live here. Here's my people, okay? Uh, Mike had said, you know, find your people. Well, here they are, okay? I got a whole community, okay, of independent dudes. I mean, these are, these are rugged individualists, okay? All joined in this one community. And boy, did I ever want to live here. Uh, because my conclusion was that whatever I wanted to do in my life, okay, there would be no restrictions put on it here. Snow King was skiing in Jackson Hole until 1965. In 1965, the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort opened. This is a picture of the tram tower that was built, which became the icon for Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. The tram tower is symbolic of what Jackson Hole is. The original tram, I think, carried 65 passengers, and then it was decommissioned, I think, in the year 2008, and now the new one holds 100 people. It's a very successful way to carry people up 4,000 uh, vertical feet. Just a great asset. It put us really on the map. 
Here we have the founder of Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, Paul McAllister. There was also Alex Morley, who was a partner of his, and Gordon Graham. But this man can be credited, besides building the first golf course in Jackson Hole, he also built the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, which would be an impossibility in this day and age. Paul was the uh, contributor for our, our winter economy. He really made us. The leadership of Jackson Hole Mountain Resort strove to make Jackson a premier ski destination in the United States. They dedicated to marketing nationwide to take advantage of growing interest in the sport. You know, back then, uh, we didn't have all the modern electronic equipment, so uh, it was more going out and doing direct sales work. What I would be doing then, as soon as the mountain closed that season, I would start in Florida and uh, I would work across the country and end up in uh, Seattle or Vancouver. But I was out uh, talking to ski clubs, talking to their trip chairman, working with travel agents and tour operators, and so I got to see a lot of the country, and <laughs> Japan and Europe and England. I used to get up at like uh, 4.15 every morning in the winter and uh, for ski reports. And I would call a uh, disc jockey in Toronto or New York or whatever and we'd do a live ski report. And uh, they don't have to do that now. Compared to some of the other large resorts in the region, a major challenge that Jackson skiing faced was access. Well, that's the first problem I saw when I came out. First, you haven't got a big population base at the base of the mountain, and the airport was very, very limited. So I contacted uh, Frontier Airlines, uh, Al Feldman, president of Frontier Airlines, about the possibility of getting some uh, small jets out here. That was successful, and then we expanded it on to 737s, and uh, eventually, what, uh, what is it, the 757 that's coming in here now. We worked with American Airlines and uh, Southwest Airlines. They're not servicing now, but uh, that was a good airline for uh, weekends, which was great for the ski industry. In the late 1960s, I would say early 70s, numbers were about as high as they were in skiing, for skiing at ski areas. A number of different innovations have increased the numbers. Number one was snowboarding changed the whole perspective. Snowboarding brought more numbers into the sport. And there was also the, the advent of snowmaking really has changed things. Areas that would not be able to be open today are open because of snowmaking, because the modern skier is really pounding that snow and 50 skiers will wear out a trail pretty quick, a, a narrow trail, whereas if it has snow making on it, it will stand up. Now Bill tries the snow plow. Can Charlie do that too? Nice work, Charlie. One of the major breakthroughs in the ski industry is the improvements they've made on the skis, especially the skis. They're so much easier to ski now. And the short ski, much safer. And uh, of course, uh, I think you use some muscle skiing that you don't normally use. So um, that helps uh, eliminate a lot of the dropouts because people get sore and tired. The skiers, skis, the, in the old pictures, you see, you'll see long and straight. Well, now the skis are shaped, which helps the ski turn more. So what it enabled to do is more people to enjoy the sport of skiing, and the essence of the sport is turning. It really is. I mean, go, kids love to go straight, but turning is really the most fun. And this new equipment made it more accessible, and the, the sport became more fun because of the equipment. Also, the boots. Boots used to be leather back in the 50s. Now they're made of high-grade plastic and metal and all kinds of materials that make it functional and comfortable. And that's the most important piece of equipment, in my estimation, is the boots, because they've got to be comfortable. With the high level of interest in skiing in the valley and the advances in technology making skiing more accessible, the local ski areas and groups like the Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club began putting more emphasis on cutting-edge ski instruction. Bill Briggs was one of these pioneers, using a lifetime of experience and training to develop a teaching program for skiers at all levels. 
So I start incorporating it into the ski school, and I'm running the ski school at, at Snow King, okay? And I start working in this training, and the results are really good. Study skiing, study the theory in detail, indoors, and then go out and apply it on the hill and so on. And I feel that the training I got uh, uh, from Bill Briggs was a great supplement to my education. You don't simply go out in front of the skier that you're te gonna teach, okay, and show them the right way to do it and tell them all about it, and that's all that you have to do. No, what you have to get is them to do it. It isn't that you do it so well, or can demonstrate it so well, or explain it. That's not what it is. It's what do you do to get them? Okay, so we developed this whole thing, we called it certainty training. When I came out here, I thought I knew something about education, but I found out that I had a lot to learn. While Briggs' impact on the slopes of Snow King was evident, he arguably left a bigger mark on skiing outside the confines of the controlled terrain of the resorts. Having already completed several mountaineering expeditions of the Tetons and the Canadian Rockies, Briggs spent the 60s blazing ski trails all throughout the Tetons and beyond. He was joined by many others in his quest to expand the world of ski mountaineering, notably including Peter Cote and George Cologne, both of whom shared his pioneering spirit. Yeah, so in the 60s, Bill skied, you know, Buck Mountain, South Teton, Middle Teton, Mount Moran. You know, I think those accomplishments inspired this whole new generation of skiers to be able to do those things. Briggs' crowning achievement came when he decided to become the first to make a ski descent from the top of the Grand Teton, despite having a permanently fused hip. So I'm saying it's possible. I wasn't thinking of doing it. I was just saying it was possible. And I said, no, it's impossible. No one's going to do this, I realized, unless I do it. Okay. Ah. Okay, so I'm the one that has to do it. The whole thing has to be pioneered. Okay, so I go on up. The climb up through that narrow cliff section just above the couloir, it's a steep section. Okay, the steepest part of the mountain. And you can't really um, bring your foot up and kick a foothold in the snow because your knee is up against the snow, okay? So I turn ski poles upside down and lean back enough and get back enough away, okay, that I can bring the knee up and kick foothold. Then you change feet and you do the same thing again. Okay, it's the same leg, because I can't do that with the other leg. Uh, climb up through that, make it up onto the east snow field, and then it's just a matter of climbing on up. Well, that's very physically challenging for me. Uh, I'm pretty exhausted on top. Then you have to get the skis on. You have to get the crampons off to get the skis on. Well, the, the straps are frozen on the crampons. Okay, I gotta melt the snow on that. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. You try to put the ski on and you get one on easily. The other one, when you go to put it on and you're on a hard crust and there's no flat place to do it, okay? So you, you know, you bend down to put the ski on and all of a sudden you're starting to go backwards off the north face. Uh, so that doesn't work. Okay, it's, it works something or other to get that on. Okay, get the skis on. Whew, okay, that's done. Okay, now it comes the easy part, just to ski. Boy, the snow is just right and the skis are performing just right. Wow, okay, so that's just neat, okay? And that couldn't be any better. And then you're gonna go out on the east face and you know it's gonna slide, okay? So that's going to be an avalanche going down. So you cut the slope at the exact place that needs to be cut, you know, when it starts to get the steepest. You cut right across that and everything below slides out. And everything above stays there, okay? And you go down, get to that narrow thing, how to get through that, boy, because it's only a ski length wide, okay? 
And okay, so I figured out how to do the turns and that turn this way and uh, to go into it this way when you're in it, okay? And then this way as you come out of it. And it's one swoopy of a turn, okay? With the straight leg, or the fused leg, okay? On the downhill side, get that all worked out. Okay, so go through and do it. Yeah, the tails, the skis hit the, hit the rock on this. Anyway, we get down, I meet some, some friends in the meadows, go down a short ways and come across a couple you know, coming up the trail, but not. Oh, he been skiing, yes, you know, where'd you ski? In the Grand, how far up from the top? How many times? <laughs> oh, just once, well, that's too bad. <laughs> Good fun. You go down to the valley, and of course, nobody believes you. And I could see the tracks. Okay, I could see the tracks. So I call up Jenny Heidi Cooper at, at the newspaper and say, uh, Jenny, I just skied the, the Grand yesterday and I can still see the tracks. She said, stay right there. I'll come up, we'll fly up and take a photo, which she did. We made a poster out of it. Anyway, big challenge, great fun. Bill goes over the top and down the other side he goes. And then down goes Nell. And Charlie goes down. Along with the development of the new skiing museum at Snow King, the Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club also established a Hall of Fame in order to celebrate the individuals who have contributed the most to Jackson skiing. The Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club's Hall of Fame committee considered numerous, numerous people. There's numerous Olympians here in Jackson Hole. There's been many people who have helped shape the history um, and influenced the Jackson culture. So we selected a variety of people from you know the 30s all the way until today uh, based on their influence, based on the role they played in Jackson's ski history. Um, a number of them have competed at the highest level while others have made their contribution through marketing efforts or helping to shape um, different teams, the creation of our Nordic team. Just a really, it's, it's a broad spectrum of incredible people who've really helped bring the club and Jackson skiing to where it is today. The club hosted a Hall of Fame induction ceremony as a way to introduce the new museum and the inaugural Hall of Fame class. At this time, we would like to present the plaques to the Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club Hall of Fame class of 2013-2014. We're very proud of the fact that you chose Jackson Hole as your home, Tommy. After all that great career, come on up here and accept this, please. I have a lot of fond memories from, from Snow King, whether it be the town downhill or, or just coming out on Thursday nights. Now I come out on Thursday nights and ski with my kids. Our next inductee is Bill Ashley, a man who has touched the hearts of more people in this skiing community than anybody I know. Bill Ashley, congratulations. So uh, thanks, Bill, for getting me started, and uh, thanks to uh, Kerry and the Ski Club for uh, uh, making the, the Hall of Fame and the, the museum happen. Thank you. The first thing that impressed me tonight is this room. What a wonderful job of, of uh, preserving or making alive the history of our skiing here. This is fantastic. I don't know who to congratulate, but I congratulate you all, okay? Wonderful. There are a few people who have done more to promote skiing in Jackson Hole and Harry Baxter. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's anyone who even comes close. I ski now two, three days a week. That's not bad for 84 years old. Thank you. This is a rare occasion because it It'll be an evening where two members of the same family were inducted into the hall, the father-daughter team of the Stieglers. Peppy, would you come up and accept this award, please? 
The inaugural members of the Hall of Fame have been among the most influential in creating and building the heritage of Teton Valley skiing, but many others have also contributed in a big way. The future outlook on building on the great legacy is in good hands. The Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard Club um, plans to continue to focus on inclusion, building character in our athletes, and creating world-class programs and opportunities for athletes to take the sport as far as they can. Um, we hope to see our numbers continue to grow so that we can produce the top tier. You know, we want to have a broad base um, so that we can help kids at all levels go as far as they want to. I really I'm charmed, okay. For me, it's a charming experience uh, to be associated or do things with them. And boy, there's more of them around here in Jackson, wow. Skiing is now, it's, it's become my life. It really is, my whole family uh, skis. They grew up, my three kids grew up on Snow King and uh, my wife and I ski Snow King frequently. So the sport became my, uh, th my dedication, that's what I was dedicated to the sport of skiing. Everything I did, it all evolved and got developed because of the sport of skiing and it really is a way of life for me. Skiing is perhaps the most thrilling way to enjoy the clear cold days of winter when the earth is buried under its glistening blanket of snow.